extended play version. All right, so we're going to continue through our journey of the Old Testament. Uh, why don't we have a word of prayer first? Will somebody pray for our time this evening and for me as I speak that I don't say incorrect historical facts or more importantly incorrect statements about the character of God. Let's not go that way. So uh, if someone would volunteer to pray, we'll get started. I think Berlin raised her hand. Oh, yes. <laughs> Dear God, thank you for everyone who's here tonight. Thank you for this wonderful food and the way that we share your love within our church family. Be with Tom. Let him speak your words tonight so that we can understand the Bible better. Let him speak true. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, it's a privilege to do this. Thank you guys for putting up with me. Uh, we're going to continue through our timeline today, and the, the page that we'll be working on, just to make sure you've got the right one in front of you, says at the top, Sin under the Kings, the Prophets, and the Exile. Okay, The top gray portion of your timeline says that. You've got the right page. And just for a review, and for those who are new, I want to explain again how we're going to be using this timeline. If you remember the first thing I said last week, what I've done is I've broken up the whole story of the Bible, Old Testament and New Testament, into seven arbitrary chunks, and I gave them titles. Now, those are not inspired ways to think about the story of the Bible. These are just my ways to do it. It's a way to think about this story. And those chunks, the titles for those chunks are across the top, okay? So we dealt with several of them last week, and I can't remember. Someone has their time. Oh, there it is. Tom, do you have more sin up there somewhere? Oh, I got a lot of sin. <laughs> yeah. Sin. Hold on. Here you go. This way. Here they are. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. So last week, by way of review, we talked. We started with Genesis, which means beginning, origins, right? That title coming from the Greek word. And we talked about my arbitrary title for that is creation and the patriarchs. Creation of the world, beginning of the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Then we went to the forming of the nation of Israel. That was the second arbitrary sort of title that we spoke through. Israel, the giving of the law and the Exodus event. And then we took Israel into the promised land. Okay, We spoke just very briefly about the conquest. Uh, Israel coming in and routing the Canaanites. That took us through our first part of the timeline. Now we're on the second part. We're going to begin with the story of the United Kingdom. Okay, that's this first chunk here that says sin under the kings, the prophets, and the exile. And then we're going to go right through Israel and Judah's exiles. That means they got kicked out of the promised land. We're going to tell that story tonight. The northern kingdom goes to Assyria in exile. The southern kingdom goes to Babylon. And then the southern kingdom returns. After 70 years in Babylon, the Israelites, those who were left, came back into the Promised Land and rebuilt the temple. That's called the post-exilic period. That ends the Old Testament. The last book written in the Old Testament, Malachi, takes place in that historical framework. Okay? So those titles across the top take you through the story big picture. Now, on the bottom, there's that box that runs simultaneously across the bottom, parallel with the one on top. And uh, like I said last week, I've given you the major books that tell that portion of the story. And you'll notice there are a bunch of them that we'll be dealing with this first part of this hour. Uh, the books of 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings, and 1st and 2nd Chronicles give us the history from the United Kingdom all the way through the exiles. Most of Old Testament Israel's history, historically, takes place in those books, 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings, 1st and 2nd Chronicles. All right? Then you have the prophets of Israel and Judah. Anyone know how many prophets there were? The writing prophets, I should say, who gave us books in our Bible. Sixteen. Yeah, sixteen prophets, okay? Uh, all these prophets fit into this history here in front of your timeline as well. We're going to talk about them as well. And uh, then across the bottom we have Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, and the two post-exilic prophets that take place during the post-exilic era after the exile. Okay. So again, you have the titles across the top, you have the books of the Bible that take place within that portion of the story across the bottom, and then in the middle you have the major events that take place in that period of Bible history. So the big things we're going to be talking about today are the United Kingdom and the Divided Kingdom. There is a 
hundred year period of Israel's history, the glory days, under three awesome kings, Saul, David, and the last one, Solomon. Solomon. Yeah, that's the portion in this beginning box that says United Kingdom. Those were the best, most prosperous, most wealthy, most religiously devoted days of Israel's history. It would never get any better, socially, politically, or religiously. Everything's downhill from 931 on. When they, yeah. 930 in the morning, 930 BC. It's downhill way before that. I can tell you, I'm up at five. Okay? From 931 BC, when the kingdom splits, you have civil war in Israel. You have Israel divided north and south. And you have the whole nation spiraling down and down and down into this dark era of sin. And it ultimately ends with exile. Okay? So that's the major timeline. We'll be talking through some of that. And if you remember from last week, just at the bottom, underneath that timeline, I have these questions. Those are worldview questions. Those, in my opinion, are major take-home things that we can learn from this part of the story. And the first one, we'll just start there, why avoid sin? We're going to talk through the period of the kings, beginning with Saul, David, and Solomon, right through this divide, the civil war, where you have Israel in the north and Judah in the south, at war with one another. God, think about that. God's people killing each other over and over and over again. And when I think about this history that begins so beautifully under Saul and under David, these kings that loved God, that were close to his heart, who obeyed his law, when I think about the way it ends at the end of this page, with both of these kingdoms going into exile at the hand of two foreign nations, Assyria and Babylon, I think about the question, wow, why do we avoid, avoid sin and why did this happen? Let me tell you why it happened. Because God said in Deuteronomy, we talked a little bit about it last week, that if you don't keep my law, I'm going to spit you out of this promised land. But an and... I'm going to love you, that I love you, that I love you, while you go right into exile. Over the period of this next 45 minutes, as we study Israel's 300 years we're going to talk about tonight, I think there are two things that we're going to learn. Number one, you can totally wreck your life with sin. You can. And we're going to see Israel do it. We are going to see them wreck their own personal lives, as you see the individuals that live within this story. And we're going to see Israel corporally as a nation just circle the drain into deeper and deeper and darker and darker and darker darkness. They totally destroy their history with sin. They destroy their culture with sin. They destroy this beautiful thing that God created with sin. They completely enslave themselves. But, and, and at the same time, they're pursued by a faithful God. Two things we're going to see tonight. Number one, you can destroy your life with sin. But number two, you cannot change God's opinion of you through how you act. Can we say amen to that? No. Amen. amen. And let me just review where we went last week. Two covenants that we talked about last week. The first one God created with this man called Abraham. Remember him? Genesis 12 and Genesis 15. And God looks towards, or Abraham looks towards the stars and God says, Abraham, you see all those stars? You're going to have that many kids. And what was Abraham's reaction? He laughed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He believed God first, and God declared him through his belief. He declared him as what? Righteous, perfect, as though he had done no wrong. That was the first time that we see biblically somebody getting saved in a, in a New Testament kind of Baptist way, if we want to use that language. Right? Okay? But for the next 25 years, Abraham sort of had good days and bad days. And by the time we get to Genesis 17, just two chapters later, he's 25 years older, he's 99 years old, and God comes to him again and says, I'm going to give you a kid. And he says, yeah, right. And he laughs at God. And just a few months later, his old wife, who was just as old, Sarah, who also laughed at God, gave birth to a supernatural child whose name was Isaac, whose name means laughter. Remember, we talked about this, that the whole story of the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, their names and their stories exist to tell us this thing about salvation, that, you know what, God's done something for us that we can't possibly do for ourselves. God came on the scene of Abraham's life and declared him righteous. He didn't earn his righteousness. He accepted it through faith, the same way you and I have. You just say, God, you would love me like that? I don't deserve to be loved that way. You're right. 
Okay, I don't get it, but I'm glad I got it. Right. I stole that line from somebody else. <laughs> it sounded good. good. Yeah, that's a good one. That's the story of salvation. And you're going to see God be true to that part of his character through this whole period of the kings. You're going to see him pursuing these people with his love. He just says to Abraham, Abraham, I'm going to love you if it costs me everything that I am. Remember, Abraham has that dream in chapter 15 where God splits the animal in half and he walks right through it. God himself walks right through that animal. And the imagery there is, Abraham, if it breaks me in half, I will never break my covenant of faithfulness to you. I will love you even if you run out on me. Wow. And God's character of faithful love towards Abraham and his kids is going to continue right through this timeline. But an end. They will destroy their culture and life with sin. But the stinky stuff that we're going to see Israel do doesn't change the love of God towards them. It just destroys their life and culture. And those are made, that, if we just learned that tonight, that is a huge take home message because there is this thing inside of all of us that when we wake up in the morning says, God, how could you possibly love me now after I've asked forgiveness for that thing a million times? Right? I make no progress in this area, in that area. And the answer is, God's love for you has never depended upon your success in that area of your life. It is completely unrelated to how well you're doing with that sin issue. God's love for you has everything to do with His goodness, not yours. He loves you because of His character of goodness and faithfulness not because of yours. That is awesome. That's the gospel. And we're going to see that played out in this story as we talk through this timeline. Why do we avoid sin? It wrecks our life. It just destroys us in every way. It doesn't change God's heart for us. It doesn't change His love for us. Okay, so let's tell the story of Israel's Wrecking their life and culture with sin. Let's start out with the part that says United Kingdom. The books of First and Second Samuel pick up where Joshua and Judges left off. They're titled after a guy named Samuel, who was Israel's last judge. We didn't talk much about the period of the Judges. We didn't talk anything about the period of the Judges. Come to the Bible school and we'll teach you about Judges. <laughs> the period of the Judges took place right at the end of the conquest in Joshua. When the Israelites went into the Promised Land, they didn't have kings yet. They set up people to sort of act as prophet, ruler, judge in a judicial kind of way, arbitrator, and mediator for the whole nation. This person was the military commander for the whole nation. They were the prophet hearing from God for the whole nation. They were completely charged of every part of the nation, socially, religiously, culturally. Okay? And during this period, the several hundred year period of the judges, Israel began to do all kinds of things that were contrary to the heart of God, particularly one, worshiping idols. And we just see Israel begin to circle the drain, darker and darker and darker and darker, into disobedience. That takes us through the period of judges, into the beginning of what's on your timeline here, the book of Samuel. First and second Samuel picks up with the last judge, and his name was Samuel. When Samuel's an old man, he was a good guy. The people come to Samuel and they say, Samuel, we're tired of having this little weird system of judges where they're not really a king, they're not really a prophet, they're not really a priest. I mean, it's weird, and our neighbors think it's weird. So could we just please have a king like all the other nations? And so Samuel says to God, God, is this a good idea that they're asking for a king? God says, mm, probably not the way they're asking for it. Okay? Probably not. Now, you see, it wasn't that Israel was asking for a king that was contrary to God's heart. In my opinion, that's not the case. In Deuteronomy 17, in the law, God gave a list of rules for a king. He said, when you get into the land, you can set a king up over you, but here's what he needs to look like. He needs to be a servant. He shouldn't have and now think about Solomon when I say this. He shouldn't have amassed lots of wealth. He shouldn't have a bunch of wives. For crying out loud, don't go make a covenant with Egypt. He needs to be a servant king. Pushing you towards loving God, not, look, not exalting himself in front of all of you. The thing that caused Israel to go astray at the beginning of 1 Samuel is when they came to Samuel and they said, Samuel, we want a king like the other nations. We want a king who lords it over us, who's strong and powerful. And when everyone looks to him, they go, wow. That was the problem. That's not the type of king that God wanted Israel to have. Why? 
because he was the one that he wanted them to look at and go, wow. All right? Yahweh was supposed to be the one that Israel turned to and go, wow, God, you're awesome. I want to follow you, not an earthly man. So Samuel anoints Saul, the first king. And for the first hundred years, during this period that this box is, the, you know, kind of right in the middle of the timeline that says uh, United Kingdom, Israel grew stronger and stronger and stronger under three kings who, for the most part, did the right thing. Saul, David, and Solomon. For the most part, these kings did the right thing. What I mean by that is they turned the hearts of the people towards Yahweh and not towards the gods of the surrounding nations, particularly Baal, the gods of the Canaanites. <coughs> that changed in 931 BC. Here's how the story goes. Solomon's old, and he has a son, and his son's name is Rehoboam. When Solomon dies, Rehoboam takes over as king. He's the rightful heir. He was Solomon's son. Rehoboam comes to the people, and totally against Deuteronomy 17, here's what he says. He says, you guys thought it was hard under my dad Solomon. Yeah, he was a righteous guy. He turned our hearts towards the Lord. He loved Yahweh. But he exalted heavy taxes on the people. He taxed everybody. In fact, for all the Republicans in the crowd. Um, one of the, one of the, I just think this is kind of funny. And, uh, you know, I when, when Solomon, when, when God says to Samuel, Samuel, go ahead and let Israel anoint Saul king. Samuel tries to go and talk Israel out of it. And do you know how he tries to talk Israel out of anointing Saul as king? Taxes. Yeah, and here's what he says. He says, you guys really don't want to do that because let me tell you why. This guy Saul, as an earthly king, is going to take your best 10% and he's going to steal it from you and keep it for himself. So like... Okay, what's the lowest tax bracket in America? It is like, what, 18% or something, right? And 10% taxation was supposed to be this, Dear God, no, that can't possibly happen. You know, this like unbelievable warning that's supposed to scare the whole nation out of not having a king. Anyway. <laughs> These comments not sanctioned by the Episcopal Church. Purely my thoughts. <laughs> yeah, just saying. <clears throat> All right, so where are we? Divided kingdom. Yeah, 931. Okay, so 931 BC, Rehoboam's a young guy, probably younger than me. He comes to the, the whole nation of Israel and he says, Look, you guys, he thought my dad taxed you a lot. We'll get ready for this. And he just doubles or triples the taxes. We're not exactly sure what he did. Well, that starts a coup in the kingdom. And this guy named Jeroboam, who was not Rehoboam's brother, he wasn't related to Solomon in any way, he was part of the official court of Israel, rallies a coup around him, and rallies support for him to be elected as a competing king to Rehoboam. Now, do you remember from last week, how many sons did Jacob have, whose name was changed to Israel? Twelve. He had twelve sons. I remember I said that last week when Israel inhabited the promised land, they divided the land up among those 12 tribes. Yeah, those 12 sons of Jacob, Jacob <laughs> became the 12 tribes of Israel. Well, in 931, when Rehoboam and Jeroboam have their disagreement over taxation, 10 of the tribes stay with Rehoboam. No, wait, wait, wrong. 10 of the tribes decide to go with Jeroboam in the coup. Yeah? And only two of the tribes stay with Solomon's rightful son, Rehoboam. So we have what you're going to see on the timeline here. We have two nations existing within one nation from that point forward. Those who followed Jeroboam, the one who started the coup, which was most of the country, ten out of the twelve tribes, moved towards the north. They split the kingdom directly in half. Just right above Jerusalem, we had a map. Right above where Jerusalem is today. They split the kingdom directly in half. And ten out of the twelve tribes followed Jeroboam in the coup. They anointed Jeroboam king. They set up a new capital city in Samaria. That's what you see in the middle. And this is sad. The first, the first thing that Jeroboam does is he says to himself, you know, 931 B.C., just a, just a year after Solomon died, just 50 years after King David is dancing before the ark, Jeroboam says, okay, I've got this new kingdom just to the north of Jerusalem. And where was every Israelite male supposed to go three times a year? 
for the festivals. Jerusalem, and why are they supposed to go there? God created this temple system where every Israelite male, and the whole idea was that the men go, the women and children are going to go too, that's just the way the culture worked, was supposed to three times a year go to Jerusalem and have a week-long party centered around love for God. And Jeroboam says, well, we can't do that anymore. We're at war with these people. So here's what he does. In the northern part of his new kingdom and in the south, in two primary cities, in Dan in the north and in Bethel in the south, he sets up a golden calf, just like the one that Aaron set up in the wilderness when Israel came out of Egypt. The very first thing he does, he sets a golden calf and he says to the whole nation of Israel, Hear, O Israel, is your God who brought you out of Egypt. And he institutes as a national policy idolatry in the northern kingdom. And for the rest of their history, from 931 until this timeline ends with the word exile to Assyria in 722 BC, every single king who would follow in his heir, in his line, would completely continue the idolatry that he began. There would not be one single day that any of the twelve tribes in the northern kingdom from that point forward would ever express any kind of love for Yahweh. In fact, when you read some of the stories, you know, you read about guys like uh, uh, Elijah and Elisha, remember them, from Mount Carmel? There was, a main, there was a main god that Jeroboam worshipped at these altars. His name was Baal. And there's a point of, in Israel's history where there are over 600 prophets to this false god Baal, and they're worshipping at Mar Mount Carmel, and there's only one prophet who's faithful to Yahweh. And his name's Elijah. And Elijah runs from all these prophets. I mean, I'm not going to tell you the story, but he has this major showdown with the prophets of Baal. And he says, okay, let's figure out who the real God is. <laughs> and so they build this big altar at the top of Mount Carmel, and they put a calf on it. And Elijah says, okay, you prophets of Baal, dance around it and call down fire on this altar. And if, if Baal is real, then he'll burn up this animal. And they're dancing around, and nothing happens. Okay, the story's in Kings. And after they're done, Elisha says, okay, my turn. And he stands back and pours water on the altar, and then he digs a trench around and pours water on it. And God just erupts this thing in fire, and it destroys this animal, and it kills half of those prophets of Baal. Well, guess what Elisha does after that point? He runs to the mountains and hides in a cave. You know why? Because he knew how Israel would react. They weren't going to turn and worship Yahweh because of this amazing miracle. They were going to kill him. Yeah, and he runs and he says to God, God, I can't believe it. Here I am in this cave, and I'm the only one left who hasn't turned my back on you. Wow, a dark time in Israel. And, you know, this is what I'll, I'll just say about this. And so, okay, so the story that I'm telling you is in First and Second Kings which ends where 1st and 2nd Samuel leaves off. I guess I should just say this for, by way of introduction to these books. 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings, and 1st and 2nd Chronicles give us the chronological history of all the kings that reigned during this period of the, of the united and the divided kingdom. If you read them, they read like a historical annal. It says Jeroboam, son of Nebat, began, became king in 931. He reigned for 45 years. He did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. He instituted Baal worship as a national religion, yada, yada, yada. He died, slept with his fathers, and here comes the next king. It just goes straight through, straight through, straight through. So that's First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles. They take us all the way through this period of Kings and Chronicles, and you don't see, any, you hardly see any good. It's sin after sin after sin after sin. Okay, let's talk about the Southern Kingdoms real quick, and then we'll talk about the prophets. Well, we're interested there for a second, Tom. Is there a civil war going on this whole time? Also? There is. This whole time. Well, yeah. So um, you have a really interesting scenario here. So. Okay, so when, when we have our oh hello, when we have our students at the school do this same sort of timeline across the top here, we also have them put some of the other nations that were existing around Israel and Judah during this time. And I would love if you guys are interested. I have uh, hours and hours of really fun slideshows where we can go through and we can see these real people in real places. I mean, we can see these kings: Ahab and Jehu and Shalmaneser. And, 
Jehoiakim. I mean, we can see real people. I mean, we're digging up artifacts in Israel all the time that have these people's actual faces on them that tell their actual stories. Well, it's just more than we can handle in 45 minutes. Uh, but as these kings are reigning in Israel and Judah, there are other nations that are existing around them. Egypt's one, but Assyria's one. Syria, not Assyria, is another one. Babylon's one. Persia's one. Okay? And what you have going on is you have Israel in the north and Judah in the south having to make constant decisions about who they're going to align themselves with politically. And they're usually making different choices. So let's, for instance, say during uh, the very middle of this timeline right here, when there was a king uh, in the south whose name was Ahaz who was reigning, and there was a king in the north whose name was Pekah was reigning. Pekah decides he's going to make an alliance with Syria. This is more than you asked for, I know. Whatever. <laughs> Ahaz in the south decides that he's going to make an alliance with Assyria. So Ahaz and Assyria start fighting Pekah and Syria. And that's called the syrio ephraimatic War. That's just one example of how this civil war looked. So they weren't always directly fighting each other. Israel was not going in directly invading Judah. Israel and Assyria were going in direct invading Judah and Syria, or something like that, if that makes sense. They're fighting with one another as they align with different nations around the historical vicinity. Yeah? When it was the United Kingdom, what areas did that land cover? Yeah, that's a good question. So, uh, if you're familiar with Palestine, the Promised Land, Israel proper, uh, today Egypt owns most of the Sinai Peninsula. Okay, uh, just the Sinai Peninsula is shaped like this. You have the Gulf of Aqaba, Gulf of Suez. Okay, Israel is here. I'm trying to do this backwards. Yeah, Israel's here. Okay, here's the Sinai Peninsula. Israel proper begins right at the base of that Gulf. That Gulf where the Red Sea comes up to the base of the Sinai Peninsula. It begins right there, it goes up to the Dead Sea, and follows the Jordan River up to the next body of water, which is the Sea of Galilee, and then goes about a hundred or so miles north of there to Mount Carmel and the Lebanon, which is the, hill, the highest part of the hill country just to the north. So just to the north of that is the nation of Syria, their capital city is Damascus. So if you look on a map today, if you go from the modern day city of Damascus, which is the same historical city of Damascus, and you come on down to the, to the northern tip of the Red Sea. That's about the largest extent that Israel ever occupied at home. It's not very far. It's about 200 miles. And so you could walk it in just a few days. They never owned a ton of real estate. It's important real estate, though, and here's why. You've got Egypt to the south, and then you have Babylon, Persia, Greece, Rome, all these empires to the north and the Fertile Crescent. And that portion of Israel is the only land trade route between those two empires. So although it was a small period, place of real estate, it was a very important one. So it's not all of what was Mesopotamia, it's just that part? Just that part, yeah, that's right. It's just about what Israel occupies today, really. It's not much more. A little more, but not much more. Yeah. Okay, let's talk about what's going on in Judah in the south. Judah's dealing with the same types of things that Israel's dealing with, primarily sin, after sin, after sin. And I've got a question down at the bottom there, at the base of the timeline, that says, Who do you trust? Throughout the whole period of the kings, Israel and Judah, these kings are having to ask the question over and over again, What am I going to do to solve this political turmoil, turmoil that goes on around my region? And over and over and over again, God says this to them, and He says it through the prophets. We'll get there in a minute. Why don't you turn your face to me and bring your whole nation back to me? Turn to me, love me, worship me, and I'll rescue you from this political struggle you're, you're having. Well, how do you think the kings respond to that? No. No. That's right. They say no. They choose to trust in, an, in a political alliance. They choose to trust Egypt. They choose to trust their own gold or wealth or cunning. And over and over again, you're seeing Judah and Israel being invaded by these other nations, Syria, Assyria, Persia, Greece, because they simply will not look to Yahweh. And even when he does rescue them, they often don't follow through with that, and then he ends up not showing them favor because they don't even follow through with what he asks them to do. When right. Them. Yeah, absolutely. So let's talk about how God gets Israel's attention during this time. Uh, the middle part of... The bottom line on this timeline says prophets to Judah and Israel. You see that? 
Um, there are 16 books in your Old Testament that are considered prophetic books. Now, that's a buzzword that means a lot of different things to different people. But there are 16 men, real people, whom God raised up during this historical period, starting from the divided kingdom of Israel and Judah, all the way through these exiles of Assyria and Babylon. 16 different people that God got a hold of. There were all kinds of different people. They were shepherds. They were farmers. They were the elite. They were priests from all different walks of life. And God called them and He said, Hey, Amos. Hey, Isaiah. Hey, Jeremiah. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to go to the kingdom with which you live. And they, some of them lived in the northern kingdoms and some of them lived in the southern kingdoms. And God says to each one of them, I want you to go to the kings and I want you to go to the people, and I want you to plead with them that they would return to me, that they would stop worshiping the Baals. Tell them how much I love them, and tell them that if they'll trust me, I'll heal their land. I'll remove these national oppressions from the Assyrians, and the Egyptians, and the Babylonians. Just tell them to turn to me. Sixteen times God does that. And that's the reason why I can say to you, the story of the Old Testament is the story of a faithful God pursuing unfaithful people. If you want to know how the prophets function in the Old Testament, they function this way. They are the mouthpiece of a faithful God to unfaithful people. All 16 of them. When we think about prophets, we think about like spooky, you know, Tim the Enchanter from Monty Python who shoots fire out of his cane and, you know, tells you things that don't really, that aren't relevant whatsoever. It's like, I know your name. What manner of great sorcerer are you to know my name? You know, it's like, it's completely random stuff. That's not how the prophets function whatsoever. Here's what they did. They simply heard from God, wow, I've got a message for the people, and it's this. And they went to him and said, God loves you. He loves you, that he loves you. And he wants you to return to him, and if you will, he'll bless you. And you guys know some of these books. Let me just give you a couple examples. One prophet's name was Hosea. All right? Hosea was a prophet to the northern kingdom. He lived up here in the north. He lived during the reign of Jeroboam II, not Jeroboam I, but the second time there was a Jeroboam, right in the middle of your timeline. And God says to Hosea, he says this, he says, Hosea, I want you to go marry a prostitute. And when all your friends and family and everyone in Israel asks you, now why'd you go marry a prostitute? You say this, because the Lord your God is married to you, even though you <laughs> prostitute yourself to the nations by serving the Baals. Wow. I mean, when I understood this history, when I read First and Second Kings, <clears throat> and when I began to read the prophets, and coincidentally, when you read First and Second Kings and First and Second Chronicles, you can see those 16 prophets actually interacting with the kings that you read about them interacting in their own prophetic books. So let me give you an example. In the book of 2 Kings, you read about the prophet Isaiah and his interaction with Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, four kings from the southern kingdom of Judah. Well, if you turn to the book of Isaiah, the longest book in your Old Testament, the very first verse of the book of Isaiah says the prophet Isaiah who prophesied to Judah during the reigns of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah. And as you read those 66 chapters, you just see Isaiah going to these kings. I mean, here comes Isaiah in chapter 7 